Coming up next on this week in computer hardware, AMD's A10 5800K APU preview spanking the Core i3. Samsung's new 840 Pro SSD, Ethernet over coax, making your next CPU smooth and silky, and the murder box, a $1,200 PC case we desperately want. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 188, recorded September 27th, 2012. AMD 5800K spanks the Core i3. Welcome to Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton, and this is the show on the Twit Network where we try to bring you the most important, exciting, and useful news and answers to questions around computer hardware and tablets. I'm Patrick Norton, joined as always by Mr. Ryan Shrout. How are you this evening, Ryan? Doing good. I want you to know how much I love you guys because football is on and I am not watching it. And instead, I we're recording this week in computer hardware. And for me, that's pretty big. Pretty good. <laughs> Luckily, the teams are playing tonight. Eh, eh, don't really care. So it's, so good. it's about, good news for everybody. We'll talk about computer hardware instead. Are we talking about college football, professional no. football, or arena Profes- football? Professional football with real professional refs now. Yeah. Wow. So the yeah. zebras are back. The zebras are back. I was, I was, I'm really impressed that they got them back the next day. Like they made an agreement and then the next day they're on there. So uh, I, I recorded it just because I know they're going to have, they're going to have funny anecdotes and stories about what these guys were doing during their off time and stuff. It should be pretty hilarious. So you're scaring me, dude. You know, the, the basketball thing I could understand, is where <laughs> live, but, but you've got a professional football thing too, huh? Oh, well, yeah. ESPN at eight and nine and ten and eleven, <laughs> right? Exactly. That's pretty. If my TV is on, it's usually on ESPN. It just kind of has a background noise. That is true. When Ryan Shrout isn't watching college basketball and professional football, he's probably benchmarking CPUs. Although, uh, is true. Josh? Uh, did Josh write up uh, the ATM fifty eight hundred K performance review? Trinity is here for the desktop. AMD is bringing the Core i three performance. Am I correct on that? That is correct. So we we were able to post um, uh, kind of like a performance preview that looks at just some of the gaming results of the the new upcoming Trinity part. You know, in reality, there's nothing super new about this because we we had already tested Trinity in its mobile form, uh, right. and and other than clock speeds, not not really much is changing with the desktop release. It's just you know we're finally moving from FM1 motherboards to uh, something like this that I just happen to have sitting here on the table which is an FM2 motherboard. Uh, What's the difference, you say? It's a different socket, so you have to buy a different motherboard. That's the difference. Uh, Actually, AMD, we'll get to that in the full review next week, but AMD apologized profusely about having the one processor generation per socket or so, whatever they, they only and on that socket they only had one generation that's very much not like them in their kind of traditional uh, CPU upgrade paths. But uh, the, we we got to test the the highest end Trinity when it comes out. We did a little bit of gaming tests, uh, looking at let's see what are our clock speeds at up to as high as four point two gigahertz with the turbo modes. Um, we looked at Skyrim, we looked at Dirt Three and that kind of stuff. If you look at something like Skyrim, we compared Trinity to Lano to Sandy Bridge in this case. Sandy Bridge uh, being not the maybe not the, the best option yet uh, because mm-hmm. HD 4000 has come out. We didn't have enough time to benchmark those with the updated drivers. But, uh, you know, you, you'll look. Trinity is going to be, I don't know, 20, 30% faster in gaming benchmarks compared to Lano. And uh, that's probably going to be the major difference that we'll see on these parts. CPU tests, we'll have to wait until next week, essentially, to come out with that. Again, because we've already seen this on the notebook side, it's not going to be anything dramatic. Uh, we're going to see modest, maybe 10 to 20% performance increases uh, from highest end part to highest end part. And that's a combination of uh, instruction instructions per clock, basically architecture changes and partially frequency changes as well. So hmm. you know, n- nothing out of the ordinary uh, <laughs> For for low end home theater PCs, mainstream gaming options, this will be better than what Lano could do, and that's good for them. It's it's not a part that's going to really shake up the Ivy Bridge landscape very dramatically until you get to the sub one hundred and fifty dollar price level. 
when you get into that sub $150 price level, it makes a lot of sense because uh, you're going to have pretty good CPU performance, but better GPU performance. And when you get down to that level, you know, you're not doing, you're not usually doing high end video editing. You're not usually doing a lot of video transcoding or something like that, that would maybe use a lot of CPU horsepower. Maybe what you are doing is video playback or you're doing mainstream gaming, something that uses a little bit more GPU horsepower. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's, I think we'll find that Trinity will be a very good option for low cost systems, small form factor builds, home theater PC builds, that type of thing. Uh, but it's, if anybody's expecting it to kind of rival the core i5 in terms of CPU performance and that kind right. of stuff, it's probably not going to happen. Yeah. And, and AMD made it clear earlier this year, they flat out said, we are not going to try to compete at the bleeding edge of CPU performance anymore. We're going to go for the big giant sweet spot in the middle. And, uh, and, uh, these look like they are a good step in that direction. Um, you know, I kind of, I, I kind of miss having, two CPU manufacturers duking yeah. it out for the desktops at the high end. But you know what? I'll, I'll take a well thought out, inexpensive, moderately power consuming uh, home theater box chip. Call yep. me simple. <laughs> yeah. So in other strange and wonderful news, uh, my delight over the death of the Atom has once again been premature. The Intel Atom <laughs> Z2760 Clover Trail details have been uh, released. Ryan, you wrote that up at PCPro.com. Right. Dare I ask where I can expect to find the latest iteration of Atom? It's not so just we talked Netflix about anymore. <laughs> right. We talked about the death of netbooks. I don't think I've ever said the death of Adam. I, I maybe I have dreamed it. of the death of Adam. Yes. <laughs> right. And, and this before I even get into the story, I will tell you that they're, they're continuing the Adam brand. And it's one of the questions I have for them every time I talk with their kind of uh, small form factor, low power designs is why not come up with something new that doesn't have such a negative connotation in people's the tablet minds. master 4000. That would the be better unbelievably than, than awesome, than the low power consuming 4,000. I, you know, <laughs> sorry. I just, I, I just, I just think Adam, despite the fact that they now have all lowercase letters instead of mm -hmm. uh, capital A, is just a poor brand name to associate with anything. But that being said, uh, the Adam Z2760, which is also mm -hmm. a great name for a part, uh, is previously known as Clover Trail. This is uh, built on the same building blocks as the Medfield processor that found its way into several of the European cell phones. It was kind of Intel's first foray into the cell phone markets. Um, this is the same part, only it's dual core instead of single core. It's hyper-threaded, so it supports four threads. It has a dual-channel memory controller, low-power DDR2 running at 800 megahertz. Um, you know, uh, one meg of cache, 512 for each core. We won't have to get into a lot of the architectural details of it. Um, but this part was designed for the upcoming Windows 8 tablet releases. So uh, at the, towards the end of the little editorial that I wrote on this, I think there are three categories of, ta of tablets that are going to come out with Windows 8. You're going to have uh, like the Ivy Bridge-based ones, mm -hmm. touch tablets. You're going to have the Atom-based tablets. And you're going to have the ARM-based tablets. And uh, it will be very interesting to see how the market is spread across those three categories because they're, they're fairly different. If you want a high performing part, you're going to get something that could be a laptop as well as a, right. a, a tablet machine. You're going to go for the Ivy bridge part. It's going to be more expensive. It's going to be heavier, probably going to have lower battery life. Uh, but the, the, the real comparison will be between the Atom based X86 Windows 8 tablets and the ARM-based tablets that, you know, will have Tegra or Qualcomm or Texas Instruments chips in them. And this is where the battle that I think will be the most interesting because they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're trying to go at similar price points. They're trying to go at similar customers. And you get into things like, is the x86 architecture compatibility argument going to outweigh some of the uh, power efficiencies maybe that ARM right. has on their designs? It's, it's, it's a really interesting thing. I mean, they've done other stuff to, to add them besides just uh, it, it's a dual core. It's, it's running a power VR graphics architecture. Remember, this is not, it's not using Intel HD graphics. It's using a power VR SGX 545. It's the same series of graphics that you found in the iPhone 4S uh, and uh, the Galaxy Nexus, although it's a little bit more powerful. Uh, it uses new lower power IO methods. So instead of you know, previous versions of atoms and tablets just use USB connections. 
in order to connect to uh, radio antennas or to Wi-Fi antennas or uh, card readers and those types of things because it was easy. It was convenient. It just worked. But they use a lot more power than they should. And by using GPIO, uh, I2C, UART, MIPI, those types of things, they're able to get lower power consumption for these radios uh, and kind of peripheral devices around the architecture, much more in line with what ARM designs typically use as well. So they're able to lower power consumption. Yeah, if you, show, if you look here, this is kind of their, they didn't give us graphs, so we had to make these, but I was smart enough to write down all the numbers they were saying really quickly during the, uh, during the briefing we got right before IDF. And you'll see that their battery life is comparable to, say, uh, the 10-inch the, the Android. You'll see the comparison here is 10-inch Android, 10-inch iOS, 10-inch high-res iOS, and 10-inch mm -hmm. Atom C2760, although they didn't name the specific ones. I bet you could guess what those iOS ones were. Um, <laughs> and it's normalized to 30-watt-hour battery. So you'll notice that the iPad 3, for example, has a lot lower battery life, but it ships with a larger battery. So um, it, it's a little bit offset that way. Um, but they, they are claiming to be very competitive with the battery life of ARM-based Android devices. Uh, they're claiming things like 30-day standby, uh, 10 to 12 hour battery life of, uh, you know, normal use case scenarios and that kind of stuff. So I think it will be really interesting if this iteration of Atom SOC, you know, system on a chip, everything combined, Northbridge, Southbridge features basically all on one chip. If it's able to compete with what, with what ARM can do and if people care enough about having this kind of x86 backwards compatibility to maybe pay a hundred bucks more than an ARM tablet with a Tegra 3 in it or something like that. Why do I have a funny feeling we're going to see this from a whole bunch of vendors whose names we've never heard of? I mean, I mean, do you really, I mean, do you think Dell, HP, some of the major vendors will release tablets well, with this chip or will they kind of divide along the ARM? Ivy no, I, th line? I, think, I think you'll see vendors that will do both, right? So Lenovo, right. Asus, Samsung, they've already announced tablets using this Atom processor. Uh, and I know Lenovo and Asus have also announced tablets using... Tegra 3. Um, mm -hmm. So you're, you're going to see these go head to head in the same company's product lines. And that's right. where I think, you know, if, 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 if Gartner IDC actually comes out with real sales numbers from these, we'll be able to tell which, which one did people decide they wanted more? Did they want to pay a little bit more for x86 compatibility? I mean, it's kind of interesting to think, well, I can run any application that I have on my computer on this 10 inch tablet or this eight inch right. tablet, depending on what form factor they make with the windows RT that's not going to be the case. It's going to have to be new applications built for it. There have to be things that are mm -hmm. run in, uh, you know, the Windows App Store. You're not going to be able to, like, download and install things kind of like a normal user would do. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I think it will be, I think October through the end of the year is going to be a very compelling story on <laughs> whether or not the Intel ARM battle is uh, how it plays out. Basically, whether or not Intel can actually make inroads against ARM. Yeah, it's going to be, man, Windows 8 launch, I think is going to get, it just, a lot seems to be riding on the Windows 8 launch this, this year. Yep. Uh, I, For an I, operating yeah, system I, that most people don't seem to like, like desktop users, <laughs> uh, in terms of tablet use, it's going to be everywhere. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the Windows 8 on the, on the, the phone version of Windows 8 is unbelievable. Every time I, was, I had my hands on an H, one of the HTC Windows phones, Oh, yeah. And it's a great experience. It's interesting, though. I've been seeing – I can't talk about it. It's been interesting looking at some <laughs> Windows 8 accessories yeah. that make – that deliver the tablet experience on a desktop. Uh, okay. You know. And, and it's, it's, it's also been interesting to watch is, is some of my friends who had the most negative reactions to Windows 8. Yeah. Um, once they either figured out how to get around the the, the metro interface, not that we call it metro anymore, um, or that I they started figuring out ever. <laughs> you and I both the uh, and and either basically figured out their relationship or lack thereof to metro, they started noticing that you know what there's a really lot of a lot of solid functionality. There's some performance uh, there that that maybe they picked up from Windows Seven, but. You know, uh, it also seems to come down to is delete expletive. Why did they bury the start button three layers underneath? Good. Some, right. ah, some hardware stuff I can't talk about yet, but we'll talk about it when I can talk about it. Um, it. Apple's Apple's A6 CPU actually clocked at around 1.3 gigahertz, says Geekbench. Um, 
So it's interesting. Everybody was saying, okay, it's the A6, it's dual core. Everybody figured the clock speed was one gigahertz. And there's new Geekbench build version 2.3.6, says Engadget.com. This was written up by Darren Murphy over at Engadget. Um, the new Geekbench build uh, claims Primate Labs, John Poole, latest version of the app says, quote, the dramatically improved processor frequency detection algorithm, which consistently reports the A6 frequency is 1.3 gigahertz. So uh, some hmm. people had questions about whether or not it was dynamically overclocking itself. And so far in all the instances of, of Geekbench, it's pretty much right there about 1.3 gigahertz. And it's interesting. Um, you know, it's been kind of interesting looking at uh, some of the breakdowns of the Apple A6 chip because um, do, 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 do. Let me drop that in there. Uh, Some of the die shots and stuff. Yeah, where they're basically claiming like there's three GPU cores on there, there's dual ARM cores on the chip, and that the general consensus is this is a pure Apple design, and, and or this is an, a very Apple centric design, and not just a mod of somebody else's chip on there. Right. Um, yeah. They use the terminology Apple. hand drawn for it, yeah. which seems crazy to me. Uh, I don't know much enough about like actual, you know, architect well, architecture design, but silicon design, like how you actually print this onto a chip to mm -hmm. to be able to tell if this, something was hand drawn or you know coded on there. But a, a lot of people smarter than us are saying that it was handmade, hand designed, yeah, well, hand put together. That that Engadget article that's showing up there is by uh, John John Fingus over at Engadget. Um, quote: Apple chose to lay out the two processor cores by hand rather than let a computer do the work, as most ARM partners do. Uh, the procedure is expensive and slow, but also gives the A6 a better optimized design. It explains why the chip is noticeably faster than much of its competition without needing the brute force approaches of higher clock speeds or extra cores. Um, Mm -hmm. Really, really interesting thought, the idea that that maybe there's still some life in the idea of letting humans have a greater influence on chip layout. Uh, or maybe they've just got some unbelievably talented geniuses working inside of Apple because they can afford to pay them to lay out CPUs. Oh, they could. Yeah. And also, it also reminds <laughs> you that how much less complicated, despite the fact this is an insanely complicated chip with multiple GPU processing units and the dual ARM cores and everything else that's going on, it still probably has a transistor count that's like a quarter or a third of a GPU. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Easily. I mean, yeah. We're talking, yeah. Yeah. You know, because GPUs have just gotten so unhinged. The, um, well, the benefit except, GPUs have is you can basically design one thing and stamp as many of them as you can fit on a chip, right? So it's, yeah, it's easier pace, to increase pace, your transistor pace. count on a GPU. If you've been shopping for, you know what, if you've, if you've been thinking about SSDs, it's looking, I, I got to say Q4 this year, uh, if you can afford to buy an SSD instead of saying buy, buying Christmas presents, it's starting to look better and better. Uh, Alan uh, wrote up for PCPro.com, the Samsung 840 Pro 512 gigabyte SSD. Which, guess what? Looks like a pack of cards with an orange spot and the Samsung logo on it. Um, <laughs> I was just giggling looking at the pictures. Um, 64, 128, 256, or 512 gigabyte versions. Sequential reads of 540 megabits per second, uh, 450 megabit per second for the writes. Um, you know, your basic, good, old-fashioned uh, specs for an SSD. And suddenly, I can't get the conclusion pricing and final thoughts to load. Why is it that the internet fails me when I need it the most? There it is. Um, IOPS performance is superb, class leading latency, low power consumption, five year warranty. Uh, quote, intro pricing a bit high compared to the competition. You're looking at about sure. 512 gigabytes for 400, 540 bucks, uh, which is uh, about 90 bucks more for a comparable uh, OCC Vertex 4. Um, you know, we're also looking at uh, that would be 540 based on a $600 MSRP. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what the 840 actually ships for. Um, not much to say about the firmware for Samsung products, says Alan, and that's a good thing. Samsung tends to get mm -hmm. things right out of the gate and outside of firmware fixes. Whoops. <laughs> I just made the mistake of touching uh, your website and uh, Conterra popped Careful. up a flash ad. Easy. <laughs> Sorry. Easy. I, I didn't mean to touch your website, Ryan. We, we just don't hear much out of Samsung in this area. Reliability and performance remain constant for Samsung SSDs, even across updates. A new model is likely to perform as well as possible when first launched. So basically, we're talking about uh, more optimized uh, ARM Cortex R4 controller and NAND flash pushing data at, quote, 400 megabits per second per channel. 
So this is good. So the Samsung 830 series, excellent, affordable SSD. And if you get a little bit more scratch, you can take a look at the Samsung 840 Pro series. Alan looks to be very enthusiastic about that. Yep. Uh, I was also, uh, I got a, a tweet uh, at Patrick Norton uh, earlier today. Uh, <laughs> and man, this really kind of, I was kind of like, oh, Peter Tran, am I dreaming? Did you ever think you'd ever see such a price? And because I'm a fool, I clicked on the link and nine to five uh, toys, OCZ, 512 gigabyte agility four, 2.5 gigahertz SATA, six gigabit per second SSD upgrade kit for $289 with free shipping. So not too shabby. no. No, let's see if it's sold out by now. Since I you keep, clicked on you it keep clicking things and eventually oh. you're going to buy something. The bundle price has gone back up to $349. But it was there, man. It was under $300 for 512 gigabytes, at least. For there, the yeah, there was a, we also had a sale on the 256 gig 830 for like $169, and it lasted about three hours as well. So, <laughs> you know, I think the to me, the moral of the 840 announcement is look for really good deals on the 830. Right. Uh, while it's still around. And uh, and I think Alan will have an, another review up of the 840 non-pro version mm -hmm. later this week as well. So you can check PCPro.com for that later. That has, uh, it's, the first, it's the first drive we'll actually see that's for sale that uses uh, triple level cell flash. So it should be a, a pretty decent cost reduction uh, and, uh, you know, should still be able to run pretty fast too. So more on that coming fast up. Fast is good. Yep. <laughs> From the increasingly ridiculous power supply department, <laughs> or increasingly ridiculous power supply wattages department, EVGA yeah. Supernova Next 1500 classified 1500 watt power supply. Uh, Robotex writing this one up at PCPer.com. Who, who's using a 1500 watt power supply? Uh, crazy people. Uh, or... <laughs> You know, I don't honestly, I, I couldn't tell you. I think there are a lot of people that have these types of power supplies just because they want to say they have a right. 1500 watt power supply. Keep in mind, this power supply has 16 PCI Express cable connections on it. It's so, beautiful. If Burke, if you can go to the final, final thoughts and conclusion page, the cabling, I got to say from, from a physical presence, like I can't touch it, but the cabling on this thing looks absolutely beautiful. It looks like this full yep. on industrial, just, you know, it, I just individually I, sleeved wiring. Yeah. Um, if you scroll down a little bit, you know, you've got the massive, I stole it off of medical hardware power cord, but man, if you need <laughs> all the power, this is the, this is the power supply that has all the power. It's overclockable <laughs> to 1650 Watts. If you, but you, in order to get that, you have to run a 230 uh, VAC outlet. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's pretty Unplug extreme. Like I said, there are 16 PCI Express, like graphics card PCI Express connectors. I'm trying to figure out, so like, that's eight video cards standard. Right. Or, you know, maybe you've got uh, one of those ones that uses three eight pins. So now, now you can support <laughs> like five of those. I don't, I just, right. it's crazy to me. Uh, how much how much capability put in there? But there's still two floppy power connectors as well, and it's completely modular, which is good. Obviously, most people aren't going to need all of that red cable attached to their power supply. <laughs> at any it given time, it looks like somebody. Yeah, it looks like somebody dumped out like two licorice boxes next to a power supply. <laughs> it does. You know what I mean? It's just, it's amazing. But uh, uh, gold PC perspective award, a little more AC ripple on the plus five volt output than we would like to see, but monitoring and control software, switch between single and multiple 12 volt rails. You can adjust the 12 volt output, output voltage for maximum overclocking potential. Um, 1500 watt continuous DC output at 50 degrees Celsius. Um, Ryan mentioned overclocking. Um, yeah. <laughs> You know, just, you know, 80 plus gold certified efficiency, stable voltage, uh, stable voltage, great about good it. voltage regulation. It's a nice power supply. It's a nice piece of hardware. It's $450 as well. So and backed by a 10 year warranty. <laughs> exactly. Like it's, it's actually a really good, it's, it's very efficient at kind of right. moderate loads as well. Um, so it's not like you're buying this and you're going to, 
you know, up your power bill because of it. It's, it's, it's fairly efficient as well. Plus, it has uh, really cool Windows-based monitoring software. So kind of like uh, the Corsair Power Supply we talked about a couple of weeks ago. This one has a USB connection. You plug it in on your motherboard. You run monitoring software. You can, you know, monitor the amperage, the voltage, uh, what rails are pulling, how much, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, watch fan speeds and monitor fan speeds and that kind of thing. It's really, it's really cool. It's interesting to see kind of uh, another take on power supply, something that in terms of hardware in your computer next to like the case is mm -hmm. essentially the dumbest piece in there. And when I say dumbest, I mean, you know, least intelligence kind of built in that you get to configure with and play around with. So uh, dip it's switches, overclocking, software, power supplies are, uh, are, are changing for us again. Again. <laughs> What's a murder box? Well, uh, if we're talking in computer terms, it's a it's a twelve hundred dollar computer case. Um, I don't want to get into the other answers of what a murder box is because I don't I don't really want to get involved in that. But a Canadian modding duo that uh, they're, they're called Hardwood Studios Inc. has unveiled uh, another custom PC case called the Murder Box MK2. Uh, it's an overhaul design. Obviously, it's it's kind of has its roots in one of the Silverstone cases, a TJ07, uh, and apparently it was two years of development to get to where this case is, which kind of explains the pricing on it. Uh, gets you all aluminum chassis, offers mm -hmm. best cable management, water cooling friendly design, custom drive bays, a custom black anodized textured surface, uh, and there's only going to be 499 of them produced in total. So you know the whole limited edition thing. Um, it's, it's a beautiful. really sexy case. Yeah, it's it's really nice looking. I can't. I mean, twelve hundred dollars though. That's pretty <laughs> crazy. Pretty crazy for a case like this. I imagine. I don't even know who who would of uh, what four hundred ninety nine people would actually buy one of these. I imagine you know if Nvidia is building five systems to take to CES next year or something like that. They put it in this, put green LEDs in there, cathode tubes and, and show it off or something. But I got 20 nuts. bucks. It says they sell out the entire first run. Yeah, two I months. guess. I, I mean, mean, you know, it's, it's funny. It's because you, you look at it and there's like these beautiful backplane designs that are built in that we've seen that's on some of the high end cases uh, from some of the PC manufacturers. I'm thinking of the Raven PCs uh, specifically. Yep. Um, you know, this is this is some really sophisticated engineering. I I think it's beautiful. I think the the you know they've built in they've built in a water cooling tank. I'm just yeah. It's got a removable I, I, motherboard know, tray. I, How long has it been since you've seen one of those? It's been a long uh, time. It's and, nice, and, it's, and, it, and it like sits in there flush and everything. It's not kind of like you know you pushed in there and there's like three bolts behind it. Don't get me wrong. yeah. And it's it's nice, but it's like you know so is a Bugatti. Uh, <laughs> But they sell them. People they, buy. They it. would sell more than four hundred ninety nine of them. I bet. Yeah, you're probably right. You know, but if you look, which. if you if you go to murderbox dot com slash mk two slash gallery, uh, or just go to murderbox dot com and you want to see and, and click on galleries, there's just some really pretty. I wonder how many corporate in there. networks throw up a red flag if you go to murderbox dot com. Well, uh, if I'm not working here next week, you know, ours did. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, it's, you know, when that was going across our RSS feed was the murder box. And I was like, well, I guess it's well, too late. So that's fine. You clicked on it. Well, to, I, I, mean, to, I mean, it's, it's amazing as you start clicking around and looking at the, if they can, if they actually build a machine this detail, or I should say a case this detailed, I mean, this is, you're looking at super tight machine. It looks like all individually machined parts, this really wonderful slot tray for the CD. I'm actually getting excited about this. You know, uh, I'm going to feed my kids and pay for, you know, kindergarten rather than buy one, but it's beautiful. Hey, why don't, why don't you, uh, can we get, can we get maybe uh, one of our works to pay for it? I own mine, <laughs> so I don't want to do that, but you know, I think it's it'd be a great review you. on Techzilla. I'll see what I can do. We'll, right. we'll email them. One last story before we go. Main Gear launches an all-in-one with a GTX 680. We've seen all-in-ones uh, competitors to, uh, our favorite all-in-one computer from Apple popping up. Dell's done some beautiful stuff. HP's done some very attractive, affordable designs. And Main Gear's just launched a new Alpha 24 super stock all-in-one PC. Um, 
the Main Gear Alpha 24. It's essentially it's a 24 inch glossy touchscreen uh, with a PC built inside of it. Uh, 1920 by 1080 resolution, uh, webcam above the screen. Pretty basic stats on that one. Not not the not the most attractive design, but certainly a very solid design with actually decent PC specs inside of it. Um, because you're looking at, uh, you know, 1349 for the base model, shipping with Windows 7, preloaded with Windows 8 later this month. And it's nice, though, that it's got too many PCI Express, a PCI Express X16 slot. So you have a full GPU. So if you're a gamer that wanted a very dense little gaming system, the Main Gear Alpha 24 should be on your list. So I GTX like it. 680, that's crazy to me. <laughs> One of the things that uh, we pointed out in the podcast last night is if you look at the picture, Burke, if you kind mm-hmm. of zoom in to where the graphics card is there on the back, you notice there's two black kind of circular ports. Those are power outlets, right? Because you've got there's two power outlets there for the graphics card, I'm guessing. And then there's one right above it that looks like it powers the rest of the system, like a smaller one. Um, so you're probably looking at three power bricks to keep this all in one power supply uh, afloat. <laughs> <laughs> pretty insane but consistently so we're going to take a couple minutes to answer your viewer questions we love your questions email them to us twitch t-w-i-c-h at twit.tv or you can hit us on the twitters at ryan shroud or at patrick norton uh we'd love it if you like the podcast do us a favor subscribe to it twit.tv slash twitch is the center of all things twitch and i, I want to make sure everybody knows T-W-I-C-H, this week in computer hardware. There's no extra T in there. So Twitch at (laughs) twit.tv or twit.tv slash Twitch to download the latest podcast or subscribe. Jonathan is having some VESA issues. He says, I have a Samsung PC 2370 monitor. I want to buy a second monitor and mount both of them on a dual monitor stand. Problem. My Samsung monitor doesn't have VESA mounting holes. Is there any way to get my monitor mounted? And I, I discovered something as I was searching around on uh, on the internets trying to get some more information about the Samsung PC 2370 is that you almost never see a shot of the back of a monitor. <laughs> Not an accident. Searching for pictures of it. Yeah, it's uh, but it's 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 basically it has sort of a, you know, swoopy plastic base that latches into the back. And these are monitors that they basically expect to go into the consumer market, be set up, put on a desk. And uh, I'm not entirely surprised uh, that it doesn't have a vase amount on the back, which is unfortunate because uh, it would is, be a is gaff tape an option. <sighs> Depends on the aesthetic level that is uh, <laughs> expected inside of one's home. <laughs> you know, there's I've seen I mean, it's kind of funny. Like, I've seen approved. Well, I've, I've seen it. Was, it it's oddly enough, I took a picture of this really beautiful uh uh, and unfortunately, I don't have my phone with me or I'd hold it up. But uh, this really beautiful, uh, I was in an, an office and this arm that was extending out to hold up the monitor on the desk was absolutely gorgeous. It was like chromed and, and shiny and actually had a really good range. It was like a three and a half foot range uh, between where it was mounted on the desk and where they pulled it. Um, you know, the question is, is whether or not there's kind of like a standard Samsung adapter, you know, did one come in the box that you threw out? My, my thought is though, is you may have to get creative between the Samsung desktop mount and your, uh, the vase amount that's available on the stand. I've seen people, um, you know, as Ryan said, fire up the gaffer's tape, uh, which you might more commonly know as duct tape. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Always a little awkward when the monitor starts to droop or you grab the monitor and it flies off and you destroy your monitor. Um, is there an adapter oh. for it that Samsung made? Probably not available uh, if it was. Um, can you unscrew the adapter for the back of the monitor from the monitor and then screw that onto a standard VESA monitor is another option. Uh, it's really tough. If you need, you know, VESA, VESA mounts used to be pretty common in computer monitors. And I, I, I just don't, maybe it's just me, but they don't seem to be as common as they used to be. I, I think you're right. I think as the, maybe kind of the appleification, if you will, of displays, kind of wanting them to look as pretty as well as function, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know it's, it's harder to kind of get that cool aesthetic look if you have a square piece on the back that pops out right. with four holes behind it and that kind of stuff. Um, I'm trying to think. So, I mean, we've got we've got some Apple uh, cinnamon displays, some of the older ones, the 30-inch right. displays, and they don't have Visa mounts on them either. I think you can 
maybe buy an adapter or something for those. But you know, that's that's a pretty <laughs> specific, expensive piece of hardware uh, in terms you could of always mon- do the the desktop shelf with both monitors on it shoved together. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. that's like a like a mini hutch that you you know stack everything on. Yeah, you could do that. You could if you frame it with wood, it could look like it's floating still. Right. You know, still you could creative. try. It's you know, uh, if anybody has any ideas, do us a favor. Email us twitch t w i c h at twit dot tv. And uh, Jonathan, good luck, sir. Mostly, I think you may be spending quality time at the hardware store and and bolting stuff together. Call me Project crazy. Time. Project time. <laughs> Frank says I'm moving into a new house in December and I don't want to pay the $4,000 to put in Cat5, Cat6 cable. Instead, we want to use pre-existing cable TV coax and use Mocha Multimedia Over Coax Alliance to Ethernet adapters to wire our house with high-speed internet. About 300 bucks total for the whole house with comparable speed. I'm looking online at all the major manufacturers, D-Link, Netgear, etc. seem to have continu- discontinued their adapters except for Action Tech. I'm hoping this is due to a product refresh so they can sell the new Mocha 2.0 spec and not that they are all dropping out of the market. I'm a little apprehensive since I'm not sure power line networking. I'm not sure power line networking would work in our three-story house due to the different circuits and Wi-Fi not be suspicious for the same reason, even with repeaters. Any news the two of you have heard on Mocha to Ethernet adapters would be appreciated. Um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna lay this one flat out there. Mocha is one of those things that I hear about at CES and rarely hear about the rest of the year. I had never heard um, about it. <laughs> I had never I had never heard of that. I was like Mocha. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Uh, I you know I looked it up or whatever, but yeah. I mean, essentially, Mocha is what Powerline networking is for running packets, running IP, running the internet, running the network over your the power. Uh, uh, lines in your house, uh, Mocha Ethernet adapters are essentially doing the same thing uh, using the existing coax or cable wiring right. inside of your house. And I don't, I don't feel like it's ever really taken off. It's to uh, me, it's it's a technology that's been integrated in other features. Like right. if you have a multi-room DVR from DirecTV or cable company, it's using this technology. It's passing all that data over coax, and it's using a, a network protocol to do it. Uh, I've never played with any of these adapters. I've used plenty of the power line over uh, or uh, mm-hmm. Ethernet over power line type stuff, and I've had pretty good success with the rely well with the connectivity and the performance. I can get close to like 100 megabit speeds. I was never able to get closer to like the gigabit speeds that some of those people and some of the companies claimed. The only right. the only problem I've had with power line networking is. I, I was kind of one of the early guys on that, and I had gone through maybe three or four sets, pairs of <laughs> Netgear ones, Linksys, right. maybe it was, Linksys, and they just died. Like, they, mm-hmm. they, I, I'd never, as, as long as I'm working on the computer, it's very rarely has something just died. And it just, it wouldn't connect to the other one on the other end. I'd buy one more single one, connect it, and it would work again. <laughs> Six months later, one of the other ones would die until eventually they're not on sale anymore. And right. that, that's been my major complaint about it. But uh, it, I use it in my house for connecting gaming consoles and uh, connecting the sling box in my bedroom to a network when right. I didn't want to use wireless stuff. And it did work for that. I just, you know, <laughs> if it keeps dying, that's not a good thing. No, I, I will say, look, there's, you know, it, this may be one of those products where somebody like Action Tech has kind of found their niche and everybody's happy with that. Um, you know, you're looking at like in a theoretical 270 megabit per second uh, top speed, which, you know, is going to be lower in real life. Um, yeah. But if you take a look, if you go up to the uh, Action Tech Ethernet to coax adapter kits that are listed up on Amazon, you know, you're looking at like, you know, 32 reviews and it's averaging like four and a half stars, four stars, you know, a little over four stars. And that to me is a really good sign um, that the product does what it's deliver, which is deliver, you know, Ethernet. Um, I, I would also say, um, you know, you might want to, you know, if you can if you can purchase some power line Ethernet adapters uh, from a place that allow you to return them, you could try that first or you can try using Wi-Fi first. You know, either you, you may look around the house as you move into there and find out there's an opportunity to maybe run some Ethernet up through some particular section of the house or, or yep. you know. Is the more you live in a house, the more you may notice there's opportunities, or you may have some an electrician in there to do some other work and have them snake an Ethernet cable up, you know, to the second and third floors, and then all of a sudden you can put, you know, multiple uh, wireless access points inside your house. But um, I would start nothing, with the nothing action. Nothing beats hardwired Ethernet. That's for sure. Yes, 
you know, and, and while I understand not wanting to pay $4,000, um, yeah. you know, you also, you know, get competitive bids and figure out whether or not this is something, you know, maybe if you just want to run it to three or four select places, maybe it's something you can figure out how to do on your own. Although, you know, if you're talking about snaking Ethernet up three stories, uh, <laughs> I can see where that you might not want to do that. But Action Tech's customers seem to be pretty happy with the Ethernet to coax adapter kit. It's not going to be as fast as gigabit Ethernet by any stretch of the imagination. No. Um, but it's, uh, it's certainly something worth considering. I got to be honest with you. I don't think I've ever actually seen one of these in a physical store shelf. So, um, I will, be, I'll, uh, I'll tell you, I've never, I've never used this, but I just mm -hmm. actually, literally my last Amazon purchase was another set of these home plug AV power line <laughs> adapters, uh, as of yesterday. And <clears throat> they were $45 for the pair. So if you're looking right. for something to just try and see if it works, uh, it'll work. I, I, I'm going. I'm doing it in my house across uh, different circuits, but it does depend on how the wiring is all set up in your house. And I will say, I think some of the Mocha 2.0 stuff is shipping already. Um, I could be wrong about that one. Uh, yeah, like I said, I had never heard of it until he brought Frank brought this to us. So I was like, oh, okay, something new. But um, <laughs> I imagine it works very similarly. Yeah. It's 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 functional. Like I use it for, I get, I can get maybe 40 or 50 megabits uh, of transfer out of it, which is enough for my internet connection to, to, to max out. But if I were doing right. giant file transfers, I wouldn't be happy with it. So, yeah, that's where it's funny. I was trying to explain to somebody like, you know, 802.11 works great until I'm trying to use it at the far end of my house and my house isn't that big. Don't be thinking like I have a 7,000 square foot mansion. I mean, I'm in an 1100 <laughs> square foot craftsman. Um, so, you know, the, the, the 802.11 end has to get through some plaster and lath walls, but we're not talking about a huge difference. And I had just ended up buying a second wireless access point, putting it in the far corner of the house, um, you know, which is not the most elegant uh, uh, way no. of solving the problem, but seems to have beaten it to death with a stick. And that's good enough it for works. me. Yeah. One more question before we go. Steven needs some help with the CPU selection. He says, hey, Ryan and Patrick, been listening to Twitch for almost a year now. Thank you, Steven. And I'm finally getting serious about making my first build. Excellent. Last episode, you guys were talking about talking more about CPUs and with new CPUs coming out, Trinity, Pile Driver, and Motherboard supporting Thunderbolt connections and other new features, I'm at a loss for what CPU and board to get. Can you help me out here or at least let me know what I should be looking out for? Like what would be the best bang for my buck? I'm looking to build this around November or December. My current computing wants are light gaming, Skyrim, Diablo, Borderlands, and lots of multitasking, 10 to 20 browser tabs, spreadsheets, MathCAD, AutoCAD, some photo editing. I just want my PC to be as smooth and silky as can be. Just for kicks, I'm currently running a Lenovo Y430 laptop with a busted screen hooked up to an external <laughs> monitor. I feel the college power here. If yeah, you're not in college... Yeah. Uh, that's okay because I've 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 run the busted monitor, uh, hooked up to an external monitor and dead battery, so it's always plugged in. It has an Intel Duo Core processor with eight gigabytes of RAM and an NVIDIA GS ninety three hundred M. The hard disk drive recently died, so I put in a new Corsair Neutron two hundred forty gigabyte nice. SSD, super fast, amazing, and I can't wait to put it in a proper system with the SATA three to take advantage of its speed. Huzzah! Thanks a bunch. Love you guys. Keep up the good work, dude. Thank you, Stephen. Um, here's the really cool thing, right, is you've already done one of the things that's going to, in terms of like silky, I never realized mm. just exactly how utterly delete expletive awesome the SSD in uh, my notebook was until it got shipped back uh, or basically got shipped out to get a replacement screen put on it. Uh, speaking of busted screens. Uh, and I had to go to sort of a 18-month-old uh uh, standard, regular, rotating disk hard drive. And there's nothing wrong with a hard drive uh, until you're, you know, you're rebooting your machine for the fourth time in three days and you're sitting there going, why is this taking so long? Why is this taking so long? And it sounds silly, but a lot of stuff like resume from suspend or resume from hibernation, uh, which mm -hmm. isn't a big deal for a desktop, but for a notebook it is. Um, application loading speeds, uh, you know, restarting the machine 
SSDs, you know, eight gigabytes. I've decided like for Windows 8, Windows 7, I want at least eight gigabytes of RAM on any machine I own right now, which is great because RAM is cheap. And I want yep. an SSD. And those two things alone, I think, will impact your end user experience much more than the difference between a Core i3, a Core i5, and a Core i7. That said, a Core i5 is going to just kick the ass on the the, 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 the Intel Duo Core Duo processor you're using right now is going to feel like a freaking insert something slow here it's just gonna a core i5 is gonna blow your mind a core i5 on top of your ssd with eight gigabytes of ram is gonna be one of those things where it's like yes i have the fastest computer ever and we're probably only talking about five hundred dollars six hundred dollars for the parts um seven hundred if you get a really nice if you get a really nice power supply um, you know, and buy and don't recycle a case and you get a, a good like $200 GPU uh, along with a Core i5 and 8 gigabytes of RAM, your hair is going to be blowing back. You're going to be like, yeah. this is so awesome and my games look so amazing. Um, yeah, dude, I, yeah, you're, you're right. You're be so the, only, excited, the only thing Steve. I would... <laughs> He he mentions AutoCAD and, and uh, MathCAD and that kind of stuff. I don't know exactly how you know how how exactly how powerful that kind of stuff is. Uh, it depends on what versions or what applications or, or rather what what projects, what size projects he's working on. Right. You know, I, I would say you don't need a Core i seven. Uh, if you can get a Core i seven, it falls into your budget, then that would probably help you out a little bit there. But yeah, getting like a GTX 660 or Radeon 7870, anything like that or above and stay inside your budget is going to be awesome. I do think it's funny that all those parts and then he has that Neutron 240 gig SSD already there. <laughs> yeah, I, wonder, I saw that. I, I'm notes. curious how much difference he says super fast, amazing in there, but how much difference it was on his kind of existing legacy system when he added that. Well, if you figure it was probably like a 60 or 80 or 120 gigabyte standard hard drive. <laughs> yeah. 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 You're probably right. I, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it, the, the, at that point, the bottleneck was the CPU and the RAM, not the, uh, not the uh, SSD. It's good stuff. Steven, you're going to be so excited. And uh, while we're excited, we're going to end it on a high note. Mr. Ryan Shrout, what's coming up on PC Per this week? So as I kind of talked about earlier, we still have uh, the rest of our Trinity review to write. So if you're interested in uh, the second generation APU from AMD next week, we'll be able to talk about that. We'll talk about it here on the show next week as well. Uh, and then we have, uh, we're going to look at a couple of interesting complete systems. We have one from AVA Direct that's built off a of BitPhoenix Mini ITX case. It's a Mini ITX with a Core i7-3770K and a GTX 680 in it. And nice. then we have uh, one of the HP Z1 workstations. I don't know if you if you saw those. It's kind of like the all-in-one workstation. It's got a discrete NVIDIA Quadro graphics card in it, and the screen nice. pops up on it, and you can work inside of it. It's it's a really, really cool device um, that would be really awesome to have. It kind of falls outside my budget range, but <laughs> most of these kind of high-end PCs that we build are like that too. So it should, should, be, should be pretty cool stuff. We've got some fun stuff coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we got the new Scotty vest that I can't talk about. Pelican's Pro Gear backpack. Uh, if you're looking for an, an, an armored way to carry your notebook, we have it for you. The Eton's Ruckus, which is their solar powered Bluetooth speaker system, which actually is surprising how good it was. I was I was ready to be underwhelmed, and it's bright green, shockingly bright green. My son loves it, uh, but actually does a pretty good job with the audio. Uh, we've got a headset, a gaming headset roundup coming up in the next couple of weeks, and I still nice. continue to fight with the thirty five dollar desktop PC built around a Raspberry Pi unit. So. We will talk about that when there is more to talk about with that. Oh, and Veronica Belmont, my co-host, my beloved co-host, back from her wedding and back on the show on Monday. Nice. Yes, go. the lovely Veronica Belmont, now the lovely and married Veronica Belmont. That's it for this edition of Twitch, this week in computer hardware. We'll see you next Thursday. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Schrout. We'll see you next week on Twitch. <laughs>